Hello, everyone, and welcome to the next webinar in the Level Up series, Developments at the ITC, License-Based Domestic Industry, hosted by Virtual Patent Gateway and led by Connor Houghton and Phil Eklum of Reichman, Jorgensen, Lehman, and Feldberg, and Hannah Carlin of Kellogg, Hansen, Todd, Feigl, and Frederick. Virtual Patent Gateway founder Ashley Chung has a passion for supporting women in the workplace and is committed to developing a growth mindset within VPG. Connor is an associate in RJLF's Washington, D.C. office and focuses on intellectual property litigation in a wide variety of technologies and has participated in cases before federal district and appellate courts, the International Trade Commission, and the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Phil is an associate in RJLF's Washington, D.C. office and specializes in patent litigation in U.S. district courts, the U.S. International Trade Commission, and the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Hannah joined Kellogg, Hansen, Todd, Feigl, and Frederick as an associate in 2020. Prior to joining the firm, Ms. Carlin served as a law clerk to Judge Bruce M. Selya on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the First Circuit and Chief Justice Mark V. Green on the Massachusetts Appeals Court. This webinar will be recorded for future use, and we've applied for one hour Virginia CLE. Ashley will notify you when it is approved. There'll be a short Q&A at the end of the presentation. And with that, I'll hand it over to Connor. Thanks everyone for joining. Um, I'm Connor, and we're gonna talk today about developments at the ITC, specifically focusing on license-based domestic industries. Um, so just a quick overview of where we're going. I'll start off with a couple of minutes discussing just the background of the ITC for anybody who's not familiar, going through the various requirements, timelines, pros and cons. <laughs> then we'll turn to a little bit more detail about the history of the domestic industry requirement, um, which will kind of help explain how we got to having domestic industries based on licenses. Um, and then Phil will talk about a bunch of different cases in recent years that have touched on this issue of a license-based domestic industries so that you can see how the area has developed. And at the end, we'll talk a little bit about non-practicing entities at the ITC um, and how the ITC has kind of classified those in some recent uh, movements in Congress trying to address various aspects of NPEs and the ITC specifically. <laughs> so to start it off with an overview, um, the ITC stands for U.S. International Trade Commission. It's an independent, nonpartisan, quasi-judicial federal agency, and it's located in D.C. Um, it's a picture of it on the right. And the ITC has jurisdiction over some aspects of IP litigation. There's a statute called Section 337, which is 19 U.S.C. 1337, um, and that kind of forms the basis of jurisdiction to decide IP disputes. The statute, the part of the statute that's important is that it prohibits the importation into the U.S., the sale for importation, or the sale within the US after importation of articles that infringe a valid and enforceable US patent. And so in addition to patents, the ITC can hear several other types of IP disputes, including copyrights and trade secrets and trademarks, but um, the vast majority of Section 337 cases are patent cases, and that's what we're going to kind of focus most heavily on in our presentation. <laughs> um, Section 337 cases are heard by administrative law judges. They decide all issues in the case in a bench trial. Um, there's no jury, but there's usually a um, fairly short hearing, which is between three and five days typically, which is essentially the trial for the case. <laughs> and that's heard by an ALJ. So, some advantages of the ITC are its speed. Um, the ITC typically sets a target date to issue its relief in 16 months, um, compared to a district court where the average time to trial is two and a half years or greater. Um, it can provide much faster relief to parties seeking to enforce patents. <laughs> you can also sue 
multiple respondents in a single case at the ITC. So you don't have to find multiple venues or worry about personal jurisdiction over a defendant um, in different states and courts. Everybody can be brought into the same case. Um, similarly, you can get broad discovery over foreign-based companies. The ITC is litigation over imported products. And so often the companies that you're suing will be based outside the US and it can be difficult to get discovery from them in a district court. But in the ITC, it's a little bit easier because of the jurisdiction over the products rather than the companies. Um, and then there are unique remedies in the ITC. You don't have to prove irreparable harm to get an exclusion order, which is essentially an injunction to stop people from importing and selling products in the US. Um, some disadvantages are that there are no damages in the ITC. You can file a parallel district court case, um, but that's not going to really run while the ITC case is running. And so the relief you're getting is an exclusion order, but you don't get money damages. Um, there is a risk of design around where parties can change their product that you accused of infringement and get a ruling that that could be non-infringing during the case, which is sometimes hard to do in a district court. Um, and then rulings on infringement and validity in the ITC are not binding on district courts. So although they're persuasive, uh, they're not Article III courts, and so they don't have the power to cancel patents or to have preclusive effect on findings of infringement. I mentioned there are unique remedies at the ITC. Um, the three kind of most common remedies are a limited exclusion order, which excludes all infringing products from the named respondents from entering the US, a general exclusion order, which excludes not only the named respondents product, but all infringing products, regardless of who is selling them. And then a cease and desist order, which ensures compliance with exclusion orders and violation of which can lead to civil penalties, which are money damages, but they're more like a fine that's paid to the government. So some unique aspects of the ITC and where we're kind of going with the presentation today have to do with domestic industry. So in addition to needing to show that the products that you're accusing of infringement are imported in order for the ITC to have jurisdiction at all, the complainant or what would typically be the plaintiff in a district court case needs to show that they satisfy the domestic industry requirement. <laughs> And Hannah's going to get into the kind of backstory of where this comes from in the next section. But from a high level, there are the economic prong and the technical prong of domestic industry. And the technical prong requires that there be an industry in the United States related to articles protected by the patent. Essentially, you have to show that you make or your licensee makes products that actually practice the patents at issue. And then the economic prong requires that there is an industry in the United States where the complainant or licensees have made significant or substantial investments in the products that practice the patents. And so it's kind of a high hurdle and something that's getting more difficult to prove over time, actually. Um, but this is sort of a whole nother requirement that the patent holder has to prove in order to win an ITC case and get an ex exclusion order. So in addition to proving infringement and that your patents are valid, you also have to show that you satisfy the de domestic industry requirement. And that's where we're going today to talk about license-based domestic industries. So turn it over to Hannah. I think you're still on mute. Sorry. Um, so the history of the domestic industry requirement will explore from the enactment of Section 337 in 1930 to some amendments in 1988 that were spurred by how the ITC was interpreting the term industry and then look at how the amendments to the statute have been used today. So as Connor mentioned, the first prong of domestic industry is the economic prong. And so Section 337, as it was initially enacted, prohibited unfair methods of competition and acts that had the effect of destroying or substantially 
injuring a U.S. industry. Now, the statute as written remained in place for another 58 years. Before 1988, the statute did not define the term industry as it was used at all. The ITC then interpreted the term to mean domestic manufacture or production of the patented product by the patentee or the licensee. This could include substantial servicing activities such as domestic repair and installation as well, but it did not extend to companies that were merely importing products. For instance, American importers who produced products abroad and engaged in relatively small non-promotional and non-financing activities in the US could not satisfy the economic prong. Congress accepted the standard definition as the ITC interpreted it, and they referenced the ITC's definition approvingly in a 1973 House report, noting that the patents had to be exploited by production in the US. In 1988, Congress changed the statute to add what is now Section 337A, which was in response to an invitation from the Federal Circuit. In 1983, the Federal Circuit, in a case called Shaper, which was about toy trucks, the Federal Circuit had rejected the toy maker licensee's arguments that its employment of labor capital satisfied the domestic industry requirement. Shaper excluded the US-based designers' research and development expenses because they weren't included in the statute and found that because the toys were produced abroad, that the licensee had failed to satisfy the economic prong. In reaching this decision, the Federal Circuit noted that it was for Congress, rather than for the courts or the ITC, to legislate this policy. Congress accepted the invitation and amended the statute. The amendments made clear that domestic production was no longer required so long as significant investment and activities of the type enumerated were happening domestically. So the statute as amended specifically enumerated three instances in which domestic industry could exist beyond just production. A provided for significant investment in planter and equipment. B provides for significant employment of labor or capital which was the specific type of domestic industry that the Commission and Federal Circuit had both rejected in the Shaper case. Finally, or C, a substantial investment in the patents exploitation, including engineering, research and development, or licensing. Unlike A and B, subsection C has the additional requirement of exploitation, which requires a nexus between the asserted patent and the U.S. investment in the exploitation. Exploitation has been interpreted broadly to include efforts to improve, develop, or otherwise take advantage of the asserted patent. For instance, exploitation includes research and development activities that go toward developing domestic industry products that embody in practice the asserted claims that relate to fundamental technology embedded in those domestic industry products. Moreover, evidence of investment in a protected article that practices the patent can also usually support the inference that the investment was itself an exploitation of the patent. Once the technical prong of domestic industry has been established, the investments in those products constitute investment in protected articles that practice the patent, which alone can satisfy this exploitation requirement found in subsection C. And then if we go to the next slide, in adding subsection A, Congress sought to remedy that the ITC's interpretation of industry did not protect innovators who came up with inventions or sought to license their intellectual property, but did not produce anything domestically. Congress specifically wrote in 1986 reports that it wanted to strengthen the effectiveness of Section 337. Those reports that came out just a year before the amendments explained that the new definition of domestic industry didn't require production of the product so long as significant investment or other economic prong activities listed in Section A of the statute were happening in the United States. This was because Congress wanted to make Section 337 broader and felt that the ITC was interpreting industry far too narrowly. In writing this, Congress specifically cited the Commission and Federal Circuit opinion that arose out of Shaper and the toy trucks noting concern that the commission was interpreting the domestic industry requirement inconsistently and in, in an unduly narrow manner that was inadequate to protect American innovators. The Federal Circuit detailed this revision history in a 2013 case called Interdigital Communications. There, the Federal Circuit explained 
that Section 337 now provides protection for industries based on the creation and exploitation of intellectual property, even without production of the ultimate products practicing that technology. Now we can look at the economic prong based specifically on licenses. The ITC has explained that the economic prong activities required to show domestic industry can be met by licensees in addition to or instead of by the patentees themselves. Licensees, research and development expenses, creation of prototypes and other activities have since routinely been found to satisfy the domestic industry requirement since the statute was amended in 1988. For instance, a licensee who does not manufacture products at all can rely on the investment and employment activities of its manufacturing licensee to satisfy the economic prong of domestic industry requirement. The technical prong examines whether domestic industry actually produces articles covered by the patents, as Connor mentioned. Basically, what the commission is doing in this test is examining whether the products would be found to infringe if another entity was producing them and importing them into the United States. The technical prong can also be met based on licenses. Subsection A of 1337 requires the investment or other activities for the economic prong be made with respect to the articles protected by the patent. It does not require, however, the party to manufacture the product at all, nor does it require any other domestic party to manufacture the product. Now we'll turn it over to Phil to discuss some examples of more recent cases analyzing these requirements. Okay, so um, <clears throat> we're gonna walk through a few cases here uh, and talk a little bit about the facts of some of them, um, just to sort of get a sense of how uh, cases have played out where complainants have relied on the investments of their licensees uh, to satisfy the economic prong of the domestic industry requirement. Um, so to start it off, we're going to take a look at um, uh, case uh, uh, investigation number 1058, um, certain magnetic tape cartridges and components thereof. So in this case, um, economic domestic industry was found based solely on investments of a complainant's licensee, including the licensee's investments in related products that interestingly were not covered by the asserted patents. So to get into the details a bit here, the complainants in this case, uh, which were Sony Corporation and several of its subsidiaries, relied on two buckets of investments for economic DI. First were their own investments and expenditures in labor and capital. And second were the investments of IBM, which was Sony's licensee in maintenance and research and development. So here the ALJ found that Sony's US-based activities were largely those of an importer and found them not quantitatively or qualitatively significant for purposes of satisfying uh, the domestic industry requirement. Uh, the domestic activities that were considered but found insufficient in this case included things like labeling, sales, warehousing, and distribution of the domestic products. So these activities were found not to be significant because the products were fully manufactured outside of the United States and Sony's US-based activities were found not to have any meaningful bearing on the practice of the Sony domestic industry products. Accordingly, those activities were found to be insufficient to satisfy the economic DI requirement. IBM's investments and expenditures, however, were found uh, to be both quantitatively and qualitatively significant, and therefore were sufficient to satisfy the domestic industry requirement. The IBM investments that Sony relied on were with respect to two product categories. First were IBM's uh, tape cartridges, which were essentially tape cassettes that contained a tape media. And the second were the corresponding IBM tape drives, which were devices for writing and reading data uh, from the cartridges. The patent claims were directed to just the tape media um, and the ALJ found that the IBM tape cartridges did indeed practice the claims. So um, IBM's investments in the tape and the tapes themselves, the tape cartridges, were considered in determining whether Sony satisfied um, the economic DI requirement. Importantly, the ALJ also found um, that it was not possible to exploit those, those IBM tapes, which were the specific protected articles, without the corresponding IBM tape drives. <clears throat> 
So IBM's um, investments associated with the tape drives were also considered, even though the tape drives were not actually covered by the patent claims. On review, the commission upheld the ALJ's findings uh, with respect to economic DI. Um, and so this case gives us an example of how a licensee's investments in the protected article, as well as investments in uh, related but non-protected articles can be effectively leveraged to more easily satisfy the economic DI requirement. So going to our next slide, um, we uh, will take a look at uh, investigation 1073. This is certain thermoplastic encapsulated electric motors, uh, components thereof, and products and vehicles containing the same, number two. Um, so in summary, so in this case, um, the complainant was found not to satisfy the economic prong of the DI requirement because its licensee's investments did not relate to an article that was found to practice the patent. Um, the complainant in this case was Intellectual Ventures, which essentially is a non-practicing entity uh, that relied solely on the investments of its licensee, which was NCAP Technologies. The technology at issue related to thermoplastic encapsulation of electric motors, and the domestic industry product was NCAP's electric fluid pump called the NCAP solar pump or the kickstart pump, uh, which was powered by solar energy. So the ALJ found that there was no domestic industry because none of NCAP's investments related to an article that practiced a claim of the asserted patents. In other words, the domestic industry product did not satisfy the technical prong, so NCAP's investments in that product could not be used to satisfy the economic prong. The crux of the issue here was that at the time uh, the complaint was filed, the complainant's evidence was insufficient to show that the actual kickstart pump um, that was produced and analyzed during discovery period actually satisfied every claim element of um, the asserted patent. So despite finding that the technical prong was not satisfied, the ALJ nevertheless analyzed uh, NCAP's investments for purposes of the economic prong. And the ALJ found that complainants' uh, economic prong DI case suffered under all three types of investment categories. So regarding plant and equipment, the ALJ found that the investments were not sufficiently tied to the domestic industry product, so they were neither qualitatively nor quantitatively significant. With respect to labor and capital, um, the ALJ found that NCAP's labor costs were simply not quantitatively significant to satisfy the economic prong. And with respect to research and development, the ALJ found that in, uh, the investments were, quote, plainly not qual quantitatively significant, end quote. And so on that basis, the ALJ found them insufficient to satisfy uh, the economic prong. So on review, the commission affirmed the ALJ's findings and held that even if IV had shown that there was a domestic industry product that practiced the patent, IV's investments were too modest to meet the domestic industry requirement. So this is a case that highlights two issues with relying solely on licensees, uh, which are ensuring that the domestic product practices um, uh, practices at least one claim, all of the claim elements, and determining whether the domestic investments are sufficiently substantial to meet the economic prong. So on our next slide, we're, we'll take a look at um, a different case. This is um, investigation 1130, um, certain beverage dispensing systems and components thereof. The issue with economic DI in this case was whether domestic value uh, was added by the complainant's licensees was significant. So the complainant in this case, um, two Heineken entities, uh, and that's Heineken like the beer, uh, relied on investments of its licensee called Hopsy, uh, which it characterized as a small and growing startup business. The technology at issue related to a tabletop beer dispenser in which the entire beer line from the mini keg to the outlet end of the dispenser is uh, fully disposable. So Hopsy imported under license a number of components, including the dispenser itself, and then added value to the system through additional inputs, including domestically sourced beer. And this is because some of the claims required a carbonated beverage. So beer was part of uh, what was required. Um, the respondents, which included an, uh, Anheuser-Busch and InBev entities, argued that Hopsy's investments uh, should be considered in the context of a much larger domestic industry which they said would include um, Anheuser-Busch, Heineken, and other large 
uh, beer industry players instead of just looking at Hopsy and looking at the smaller uh, homebrew industry itself. So the ALJ found that Hopsy's investments were indeed significant. And the ALJ noted that Heineken and, and uh, Anheuser-Busch and InBev's expenditures in, in their worldwide business would of course dwarf Hopsy's expenditures. Um, and that such a, but the ALJ found that such a comparison of those expenditures to Hopsy's would, would not be meaningful in this context because those two respective industries, the, the big you know, Anheuser-Busch InBev industry versus that of Hopsy, um, were too different, and, and so um, the comparison there would not be useful. So the ALJ reasoned that Hopsy's investments were indeed significant, um, not only in the context of a, of a small startup business, but also in the context of investments that um, Heineken and Hopsy made with respect to this nascent and sort of emerging uh, home draft beer industry. So on review, the commission largely adopted the ALJ's findings um, the commission agreed that Hopsy's investments were significant um, for the reasons that the ALJ explained, um, despite the fact that Hopsy's investments would be uh, essentially dwarfed by, you know, bigger uh, companies like Anheuser-Busch and uh, Heineken itself, uh, if you were to consider the, the broader beer market. So this case um, shows how even a relatively small licensee's investments can be considered legally significant for purposes of satisfying the economic prong um, with proper frank framing of the domestic industry issues. So moving on to our next case, this is uh, investigation 1131, certain wireless mesh networking products and related components thereof. Uh, the issue with economic DI in this case, and this is um, a kind of a two part um, case that we'll discuss. Um, so it's a little bit longer than the others, but the issue here um, with economic DI uh, was whether the complainant's investments in licensing, um, and, and that's just licensing, the asserted patents uh, could by themselves satisfy the economic prong under all three um, subparagraphs A, B, and C. So here the complainant, SIPCO, was effectively a non-practicing entity that licenses patents covering wireless mesh technology. And for the technical prong, SIPCO's domestic industry products included products of its licensee, uh, which was Honeywell. For the economic prong, however, SIPCO relied on uh, only its investments in licensing. So in other words, it did not rely on the investments of its licensee Honeywell in any way. Um, and, and SIPCO was applying its licensing investments under both um, or all three uh, uh, subparagraphs A, B, and C. So not just C, which you know, you, you might typically expect for, a, for um, licensing activities. So SIPCO presented evidence of its investments in licensing under all three subparagraphs, which was akin to what was done in a prior investigation, um, number 1097, uh, which was done in that case with respect to um, investments in research and development. So with respect to looking first at just the, the uh, investments under subparagraphs uh, A and B, which are for plant and equipment and labor and capital, the ALJ found that SIPCO's uh, subparagraph A and B investments were not tied to the domestic industry products. And so they were not, they were, um, they were not found sufficient for satisfying the domestic industry requirement. The ALJ held that um, a complainant that claims only its licensing expenditures to satisfy the economic prong cannot dispense with the traditional requirement to demonstrate investments with respect to the articles protected under subparagraphs A and B. So in other words, um, even though uh, just because SIPCO was rel relying on its investments in licensing, it could not um, do, it, it was nonetheless required to um, allocate its, its expenses uh, to a domestic product, which is, typically done. Um, the ALJ reasoned that the investments in licensing under A and B should be just like those that the commission uh, found cognizable for research and development uh, in the 1097 investigation. And those investments included things like costs in labor and capital and other expenses that it takes to conceive and bring to market a product, in addition to the costs of refining products that are in the market and updating the operating uh, software of products so that the products can run optim optimally and provide the users with the best possible user experience. In other words, the, the, the investments have to relate to uh, 
the identified domestic industry product. But in this case, the ALJ also reasoned that a pure licensing entity incurs no such expenditures, which is why complainants often rely on the investments of their licensees. So the, uh, the, the, the ALJ essentially deemed that it would be impossible to do that. Um, and so that rationale sort of questions whether it's even possible for a complainant to rely on its own licensing investments under subparagraph A and B. Um, SIPCO's investments in licensing patents were found insufficient under A and B because uh, those investments were not allocated to the Honeywell domestic product that they identified. Um, and those investments were uh, uh, as follows. So under subparagraph A, SIPCO was pointing to uh, investments in facilities that it used to conduct its licensing operations. So um, they were not found to be tied to the product. And under subparagraph B, SIPCO identified activities of its employees and its licensing operations, and uh, as well as entering into licensing agreements covering at least one of these certain patents with roughly 100 other companies and engaging in licensing discussions with roughly 100 additional companies. So again, these um, activities were not shown to be sufficiently tied to the Honeywell domestic products. Um, so that covers uh, the investments under A and B. So turning to the next slide, um, with respect to investments under subparagraph C, the ALJ found that SIPCO uh, had in fact satisfied the nexus requirement to show that its US-based activities were in the exploitation of the asserted patents and that those activities were linked to licensing efforts concerning the asserted patents. However, the ALJ found that SIPCO subparagraph C investments were not allocated to the domestic industry product. So similar problem with the investments under subparagraphs A and B. Um, the ALJ reasoned that the economic prong requirement, which applies to subparagraph C um, domestic industries, necessitates an appropriate allocation under each subsection to activities related to the protected articles. So the ALJ further reasoned that not requiring a complainant to allocate licensing investments under subparagraph C to a domestic product would run afoul of the commission's rejection of a special and more lenient test for licensing based industries. In other words, um, the commission has held that just because a licensee may rely or that a complainant may rely on um, licensing investments uh, by themselves, that doesn't mean that if you do, a complainant should have somehow a sort of easier way of satisfying the economic prong requirement. So without allocation of SIPCO subparagraph C investments to the domestic product, the ALJ found that the investments would be insufficient to um, satisfy economic DI. Um, so on review, the commission um, ended up taking no position on whether SIPCO satisfied the domestic industry requirement, which was uh, a, a little bit interesting there. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, yeah, it took, it, it took no position instead of um, affirming or modifying. Um, so this case kind of sheds light on what a complainant may need to prove uh, when seeking to rely on just the investments of its licensing, uh, when relying on just the investments of its um, licensing activities as opposed to um, those of its licensee. Yeah, and so just to jump in to highlight the kind of distinction between this case and some of the other ones we talked about, <laughs> the statute lets you rely specifically on section C in licensing activities. So rather than licensee, licensing. And so, you know, in the previous cases, Phil talked about the complainant was licensing its patents to other companies and relying on the investments and the products of those other companies to satisfy domestic industry. In this case, they license the patents, but the what they were trying to rely on as their investments was not the investments that their licensee was doing, but the actual money that they spent in doing the licensing. And that's something that the statute technically allows you to do, but it seems like based on this case and other recent kind of developments, it's almost impossible to actually rely on those licensing investments as opposed to licensee investments. Yeah, that's right. And, and to sort of put a finer point on what, what is you know, a little bit more difficult here is that when you have um, the types of investments that um, the licensor is making, they they just don't quite so easily, um, they're not so easily um, allocatable to 
the domestic industry product. So we have the technical form requirement. And so we have to, you know, as this sort of, as this case explains, tie those investments to the product. So if there's, if there's an easier way or a clearer way to tie the licensing investments to the product itself, um, then the case may have, you know, come out a little bit different or cases in the future may, you know, take a different path. But here, the problem was that the, in the types of investments that they were relying on, the types of activities they were relying on for those investments um, didn't pair up with the um, one domestic product that they had identified in that case. So turning to um, our next couple cases here, and these are a little bit shorter, um, uh, Investigation 1145. So this was a trade secret case. So unlike our other cases, which were all patent cases, this one involved um, a trade secret. And one of the questions here in this case was whether the complainant was allowed to rely on investments made um, by unrelated licensees. So in other words, um, entities that were not related corporate entities uh, for purposes of proving the, the uh, existence of a domestic industry. But uh, you know, here it was held that yes, a complainant is indeed allowed to rely on the investments of non-exclusive licensees to satisfy the economic prong. So it's, um, you know, perhaps not a, um, you know, a tremendously eye-opening uh, case, but the, the point here is that when we're talking about relying on the investments of licensees, we could be looking at, um, you know, sort of a range of different types of licensees. So it may be a, an exclusive licensee where the patent holder and the exclusive licensee come together, uh, or it may be um, that the complainant relies on a host of licensees that are not exclusive licensees, but anybody who has a license to the patent um, and um, whose you know, products uh, practice that patent and whose investments can be relied on uh, in that way. So um, this case kind of just points out that there's a little bit broader of a spectrum to what kinds of licensees investments can be relied on by a complainant for satisfying economic DI. Yeah, and we'll come back to this a little bit at the end, but an interesting thing that sometimes happens is the, in these cases is that a complainant will file a case based on a licensee's domestic industry without telling their licensee that they're going to do it. And then they'll serve them with a subpoena and seek all sorts of information that they need, but they won't necessarily have to be a willing participant in the case to get dragged in and be basically used to satisfy domestic industry. And that's one of the things that some of these more recent um, bills in Congress are trying to address because that's not very popular for big companies who take licenses to get out of litigation and then get pulled back into the ITC. Um, and so there's some, a little bit of momentum to try and stop that practice, but we'll talk about that at the end. Yeah. And as a, as a practical point, you know, when, um, as Connor mentioned, when you have a situation where the, the complainant files the case without necessarily getting the licensee on, you know, fully on board right away um, so that they can rely on those investments, um, situations can arise where um, the evidence that would be needed to make a strong showing of um, how uh, the licensee's investments can be used to satisfy economic DI. Sometimes those, those facts and that evidence just doesn't come to light during the discovery period. And the result can be um, like some of these cases we discussed where the evidence um, is just insufficient to show um, that those investments are more sufficient or perhaps those investments don't, don't, don't appear at all in the case. So um, that sort of dovetails with what Connor will be talking about uh, or what we'll be discussing a little bit more um, here in a few minutes, but um, the idea that there are, uh, let's just say unwilling licensees or parties that are not, um, uh, that, that don't wanna participate in the case but have to be subpoenaed and the, the net result can be um, not enough evidence to, to, to satisfy the, the DI requirement. And you know, unfortunately, it doesn't go so well for complainants in those situations. So we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit more later on. So our next case, um, investigation 1199. So certain tobacco heating articles and components thereof. So the complainants in this case, um, which were the patent holder and its exclusive licensee, R.J. Reynolds, um, relied on the investments of just R.J. Reynolds under subparagraphs A and B for three asserted patents. 
Here, the ALJ granted a summary determination that the economic prong was satisfied with respect to two of the three patents, finding that the material facts were undisputed. So making that sort of a, an, an easy uh, win for the, the complainants here. The ALJ denied summary determination as to the third patent in light of some disputed facts, but the ALJ ultimately found that Reynolds investments under the third patent were sufficient to satisfy uh, the economic prong. The commission affirmed the ALJ's findings um, in full. And um, the interesting thing here is that the parties largely stipulated to the facts as to the amounts of uh, Reynolds investments throughout the proceedings. Um, but what they disputed really was the legal significance of those investments. So um, they weren't really disputing the numbers or um, necessarily what the experts um, said about them, but they were um, uh, in terms of the calculations and how they were derived. Um, but the stipulations were as to just the legal significance, which were those numbers enough to satisfy the requirements. So this case um, uh, kind of goes to show that even where certain facts are undisputed and, and perhaps even stipulated to, um, that it's still pretty important to assess the significance of the domestic industry uh, of the licensee. And um, because even when certain facts are, are undisputed, the ALJ uh, will have to decide whether um, what, uh, what those investments are, if they are legally significant um, in terms of satisfying economic DI. So that covers our, our cases. Um, so I'm gonna turn this back to, uh, I think Hannah is gonna talk us through our, our next section here on NPEs. Yeah, thanks, Phil. Um, so Phil mentioned during one of those cases, I think it was the second one, um, non-practicing entities and their investments. Uh, so the ITC began tracking the number of investigations brought by non-practicing entities in 2006, which is interesting because the ITC acknowledges that there's no commonly accepted definition of NPE and instead relies on the FTC's analysis and definition uh, for tracking purposes without doing its own definition. So the FTC breaks NPEs into two categories, which they call category one and category two. Both categories um, are about entities that don't manufacture products practicing the asserted patents at all. And in the first category, they give some examples um, right in the definition, which include inventors who do research and development, build prototypes, but don't manufacture ultimate products. Um, and these types of entities tend to rely on licensing investments to meet the DI requirements, uh, like Phil was talking about in specific investigations. Another example is research institutions like universities and labs. And then finally startups that have intellectual property rights but haven't started making anything yet, or maybe won't like Hopsy. So the next slide talks about the second category, which likewise includes entities that don't manufacture products practicing the asserted patents, but adds that those entities' business model be primarily focused on buying and asserting patents, like those who are trying to rely on the license, licensing expenses. The next slide shows a graph we made um, demonstrating the total number of investigations in dark blue, and then it shows the categories one and two in light brown and light blue respectively um, in the last 14 years or so. So this is interesting. Um, the low came in 2015, the low of NPE springing investigations with 5.6%. And we're at a high in 2012 with nearly a third of the investigations being brought by one category or the other of NPE. Throughout this whole time period, since the ITC began tracking, about 15 to 20% of these investigations were brought by NPEs. So it's important to start thinking about them and understanding how they can meet domestic industry requirements um, given their prevalence here in the ITC. Um, so now I'll turn it over to Connor to discuss the future of NPE investigations as well as proposed le legislation in this area. Yeah, so I mentioned earlier that there are a few bills that have been going around in Congress. <clears throat> and it's one important thing to remember is there's almost always some bill related to the ITC in Congress, and it almost never passes, um, which is why the statute has remained 
largely unchanged since 1930, with the exception of the kind of big amendments in 1988. Um, but there's a bill called Advancing America's Interest Act, which is HR 5184. Um, and the goal of this bill is to eliminate the domestic industry loophole, as some call it, exploited by NPEs. Um, and this is kind of what I was talking about with the um, unwilling licensee. So often, not often, but sometimes a patent holder can file a complaint in the ITC without even telling the licensee that it's going to rely on its investments. And so this sometimes happens with the category two type NPEs that don't, you know, never really made the products and bought the patents from someone else and then asserted them. <clears throat> um, they can file the case, say, we're going to rely on, say, Apple's investments and then subpoena Apple to get a bunch of business records after the case starts. Um, it's a risky proposition and obviously it doesn't happen a lot based on the chart we just looked at, but it can happen. And obviously the big companies that are the ones getting subpoenaed don't like this. <laughs> um, and so this bill would try to eliminate the ability to do that by requiring that the licensee join voluntarily as a co-complainant in the case. And so you couldn't rely on a licensee's investments without adding them as a co-complainant in the case. Um, and so this would prevent third parties who don't want to use Section 337, you know, maybe they independently could have had domestic industry um, if they owned the patent, but they don't. They're just trying to make their own products and, you know, they have their license. Um, and this would prevent them from getting dragged into the cases. <laughs> um, another aspect of this particular bill is eliminating the public interest loophole exploited by NPEs. And so I mentioned at the beginning that to get an exclusion order in the ITC, you don't have to prove all the same things that you do in a district court. So in a district court, it's pretty hard to get an injunction these days based on winning a patent case. You have to prove irreparable harm and public interest under the eBay case. You don't have to do that in the ITC. There is kind of lip service paid to the public interest at the ITC. Most of the time it doesn't come into play. Um, this bill would essentially increase the amount of showing you have to make that the exclusion order would not affect the public interest or would serve the public interest positively. Um, and it would expand the things that the ITC looks at to more broadly reflect, reflect the um, impact that an exclusion order would have on the US economy. Um, So a little bit about why this bill has more momentum than some others. Um, it actually was made it into committee with bipartisan support and it has broad industry support from you know, industries like the automotive industry, the tech industry, things like that. There's a bunch of companies listed here that have signaled support for this bill. Um, and it's interesting because as you saw on the chart that we looked at, <clears throat> NPE type companies have sort of, after a low in 2014 and 15, have been increasing their presence at the ITC a little bit lately. Um, and that's largely due to, especially during COVID, the ITC didn't really slow down its cases at all. Um, they pretty quickly pivoted to going to virtual trials. And so, you know, where district court cases that needed jury trials for patent cases slowed down, even stopped for almost two years. And now they're trying to dig out of that backlog. The ITC never really stopped. Um, they were quickly able to pivot to having virtual trials and keeping cases moving on schedule with their quick track to trial. And so, um, you know, whereas a company could kind of stay out of it in the district court and just keep holding off on getting to trial, they weren't able to do that in the ITC. And so NPEs have some incentive to try to find a way to bring a case in the ITC um, to, you know, have a lot more leverage than a district court case where it might be caught in a backlog of trials for five years. Um, 
here they're pretty likely to get to trial and then have the possibility of an exclusion order within just a couple of years. And so, you know, I think it's possible that this bill would get a little bit more attention now, given the fact that these cases have been increasing. And I think that based on what we went through, the kind of six or seven cases in the last five or six years where licensee investments have been used, um, this trend has been increasing a little after a low. So we'll have to see what happens and whether um, anything ends up moving forward. But it's interesting. There's a lot of different considerations at play with the license-based domestic industries at the ITC. Well, one of the things too, Connor, to, to mention about that uh, chart that you just had up there, you know, we're, we're seeing the, um, uh, the traction on this bill um, that's probably a little bit higher than, than others that have come before. But it's interesting to point out that um, even, e even with all this attention that, that it's getting, um, the number of NPE complaints are still comparatively pretty low to, to all other types of complaints. So while um, this would affect you know, a relatively small number of complaints, um, it's, it's got you know, a fair bit of attention, all things considered. So I think that's another reason why it's kind of an interesting thing to follow and, and see how it develops. Yeah, and as we discussed, the domestic industry requirement has been getting a little bit more and more difficult to prove for anybody, not just for an NPE, but for any company, even if they're not relying on licenses. And so I think that's another consideration as to why the, the percentage of those complaints are so low, because it's not cheap to bring an ITC complaint. And so if you're not fairly confident you're going to be able to have a domestic industry, then it's a big expense and a big risk for companies. Um, I think that's about all we have. So there's a couple minutes left. If anybody has questions, you can put them in the chat or you can just go on audio and shout them out. <clears throat> it looks like Ashley had a question. From a practical standpoint, do you see any changes in how ITC handles protect protective order subscriptions and parties who violate protective order issues even inadvertently? Um, I've had this come up in a couple of my cases, and it's hard for the ITC. There's really strict protective orders in the ITC. Um, you know, there's broad discovery, and pretty much everything is on an outside counsel's eyes only protective order. So in-house counsel are a bit removed from ITC cases. Um, but so that can kind of be interesting where the company is just a licensing company and they don't necessarily have technical employees. The same people who are making decisions about the case might be the lawyers for the company. Um, that's happened in a few cases, but they're supposed to be walled off from kind of the substance of the case. Um, and the ITC's ability to police the protective orders is a little bit weak, really, considering how strict the protective orders are because they don't really have the same ability to have monetary sanctions and other relief like that. And so <clears throat> I haven't seen a difference in, you know, the protective orders are the same um, and how they can police them. I haven't noticed a big difference, but it is something to keep in mind when, you know, a company might not have the same distinction between its technical people and its legal people. That's, that's a good point, Connor. And, you know, an interesting thing to kind of tie into what you mentioned earlier about the, um, the way that um, proceedings have sort of pivoted to remote type proceedings. Um, you know, one of the things that parties do is they sort of agree to, um, you know, their own terms for how certain types of confidential information are handled. So in, in some cases, particularly when you're dealing with things like source code, things that are considered, you know, extremely sensitive, um, the parties will agree to or put in place certain procedures for um, sort of, you know, policing themselves how information is um, viewed, when it's viewed, uh, things like that. So you may, you may end, 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 uh, end up seeing, you know, pretty complicated uh, procedures for accessing a party's, you know, source code. And if that's done remotely, things can get even more complicated um, where, where you may have, you know, intricate software and sort of, um, you know, chaperone systems made available where you can only access it during certain times and under certain conditions. 
Um, so the parties will, you know, in a lot of cases, take it upon themselves to introduce ways to ensure that um, confidential information is handled, you know, according to their liking so that, you know, issues don't come up and, you know, hopefully won't have to go to the commission and things like that or to the ALJ. So. And it looks like there's one more question we can probably handle. Um, what about when ITC documents are used in PTAB proceedings as exhibits, since PTAB typically does protective orders that are just standard and doesn't have tiered designations? That might be a good one for you to handle, Phil. So the, um, <clears throat> the PTAB, you know, from my, my uh, experience, you know, generally, you know, disfavors having documents, you know, filed under seal. Um, but it happens, and it happens a lot, um, just due to the nature and sensitivity of certain documents. Uh, you would think that it may not happen all that much, given the fact that you know at the PTAB, you know, we're talking about IPRs and PGRs. We're typically talking about documents that uh, are or reflect elements of prior art, which you know may not need to be all that sensitive. But but a, a number of different issues come up at the PTAB. Um, and discovery may be granted uh, into sort of ancillary issues for, for um, things related to um, standing or, or, you know, it could be a number of things. So documents do end up finding their way in. Um, but, but when that happens, you know, the PTAB does have sort of a standard protective order that they use. Um, and I don't think, you know, by and large, I don't think, um, you know, it, it, it's not... Uh, sort of a big problem to have documents that, that may be discovered in an you know, ITC case come in. I think the, the, the big issue is just um, ensuring that uh, the protective order in the ITC is respected at the same time any protective order uh, rules are respected uh, at the PTAB. So um, uh, something to watch out for certainly when you have related proceedings. And we see that quite often now where we have um, ITC proceedings that um, that spawn off uh, ITC or uh, PTAB proceedings. And, um, you know, Connor and I have participated on a few other webinars that sort of talk about the relationships between ITC and PTAB. But this, that's a good question. Um, I, I think the, the, the point though, there is to just ensure that um, both orders are, are respected and that the documents remain protected under both, under the different requirements of both, because they may well be very different. All right. so, yeah, I think that brings us to the end, Connor. I don't know if you had anything else or Hannah. No, thank you, Ashley, for having us. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. If there are no further questions, just want to say thanks to Connor, Hannah, and Phil for this presentation today, and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.